You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Roxana Eldon. At the end of the show, we're going to have an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. This audio clip is narrated by the one and only Luke Daniels. You're going to love this series. I love it so much. And uh, Richard has been a great supporter and sponsor of the show, and we're going to show him some love. Listen to the audiobook excerpt. You're going to love it, and uh, be sure to go to audible.com to purchase it. If you're not an Audible subscriber, you can get a free book just by signing up for a free trial at audibletrial.com slash Hank. You get a 30-day free trial. You get the free book. If you decide to cancel your Audible subscription, you get to keep the free book. and It doesn't cost you a single penny. audibletrial.com slash Hank, and uh, listen after the show for the clip from Richard Fox. Writers, I have an amazing tool to tell you about. A revolutionary writing tool for planning stories, Campfire Pro is what novelists need to go from the seed of an idea to a detailed plan that's ready to be executed. Complete your character design, create a timeline, and track your world building all in one place with our downloadable desktop app for Mac and PC. Without the annoying subscription model so many apps are using today. Visit CampfireTechnology.com for special holiday pricing on Campfire Pro today. Who wants to love a billionaire? Billionaires in New York, book one by Laura Burton. Do you have a favorite writer whose books are auto-buys for you? Wouldn't you love for readers to have you on their auto-buy list, then recommend your books to their friends and on social media? The good news is there are subtle things you can do Things that are nearly invisible to the reader that will make your stories unputdownable. The Beyond 10 Days course from Victory Editing can help you get the most from your stories and help you build that relationship with readers through your writing. This course is full of awesome, and best of all, you don't have to fly across the country or put on pants. In this course, we'll focus on avoiding info dumps, dialogue mechanics, show versus tell in dialogue, carrying show versus tell forward to your narrative, deepening your point of view and strengthening your protagonist's voice, overriding and how to avoid it. 10 hours of video content with text and audio downloads. Shine that diamond. Join me at the Beyond 10 Days course. Go to hankgarner.com and click the banner to sign up today. The Forsaken Mercenary series by Jonathan Yanez. A near future thriller series is now available on audible.com the series that readers have loved is now available in your favorite format audiobook format the first book is called drop ship in the forsaken mercenary series if they can't control him they'll try and kill him daniel hunt is the deadliest mercenary in the galaxy if he can just remember five years before he woke up with nothing more than his name now his present is on a violent collision with his past and the future of the galaxy. The Earth is dead. Humanity is taken to the Moon and Mars to have a chance. On what's left of Earth, primal gangs war for dominance. A rebel force will discover a weapon of unimaginable strength. The wealthy in the galaxy will do anything to possess. As Daniel unravels the origin of his past, he'll realize he's not the same weapon he once was. But does redemption exist for someone like him? For fans of Jason Bourne and the Weapon X program, this one's for you. Grab your hand cannon and start listening now. The Forsaken Mercenary series, book one drop ship, available on audible.com now from Jonathan Yanez. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Roxana Eldon on the show with me today. She has a phenomenal new book. It's called Adequate Yearly Progress. And it is a laugh-out-loud, funny satire. Um, 
in in the the school system. Something we don't get a look like this into very often. Um, Roxana, I love this book, and I can't wait to talk about it. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you, um, Roxana. We begin each show with the same question, and that question is. What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Ooh, my first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller. Well, I will, I will, yeah, I will tell you this, and I don't even know if this is a perfect answer to the question, but my mom used to write children's books when I was a kid. Um, unfortunately, she never got published, but her stories were good, and she had a group of women, women who were also writing children's books who would meet in our house. And I was in about fourth grade grade at the time. And because they were writing for kids, they always wanted me in the room. So I got to eat snacks, but I also got to kind of give my opinion on whether these kids books would appeal to kids. And I think that that exposed me pretty early to just the idea of, of writing a story and someone being on the other end of it. That is uh, it, it's so important to get that feedback, especially early on. Mm-hmm. The um, you know, the writers can go through some some kind of dark days and lonely times, and it's so funny how that early encouragement comes back. Um, you know, in those times where it seems like this is not working. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it can be very hard. I mean, you spend most of your time in front of your computer alone, even though what you're really hoping to do with your writing is connect with us with other people. So it's a pretty strange way to get there. And having that sense that at some point, somebody else is going to be on the other end of this reading, reading this, uh, it really helps you. Yes, it does. Um, what were some of your, your first, um, uh, books or stories, uh, that you read, um, that made you, uh, that kind of lit a fire in you that, oh, you know, this is a story that I love. I want to do something like that. The stories that, let's see, there's a story, a book that made me want to be a teacher in the first place, which I read in high school, which was called Always Running. It was a, mem- a memoir by a gang member in L.A. who kind of found his way through and um, and became like a mentor and, and a writer. And that was just such a beautifully written book. I I just remember reading it about 10 different times in high school and imagining myself kind of placing myself in that book as a teacher. And that was what inspired me to become a high school teacher. Uh, As far as my own writing, the, um, the biggest model for my book, which has several different perspectives is probably Tom Wolfe, um, who he wrote like Bonfire, The Vanities, A Man in Full. Those are my two favorites. Um, and what he does, he he want, came from a journalism background. So he really researches these worlds. And then he picks enough characters that he can capture the entire world in kind of a panoramic way because every character has their blind spots and every character has their filters of the way that they're going to see the information and sometimes you just you need a character to interact with another character and see that person through their eyes to get the full picture of what's going on. So if anything, I would say when I sat down to write this book, I thought, you know what? I want I want to write the novel that Tom Wolfe would write if he were trying to capture the public school system as a workplace. You know, the, the idea of, and, and I love that, that, uh, that Tom Wolf kind of set that precedent and, and I can see that influence in your writing now that you uh, kind of break it down like that. But, you know, um, one of the, um, the best parts about writing is world building and kind of, you know, mm-hmm. building the world and, and outfitting it with the things that you need. Um, but doing that with character. Uh, is a really unique way to to show the world as it is and by showing these characters characteristics and that becomes your world building um, because character is everything isn't it mm-hmm. and I would even say it's really hard to separate the characters from the world exactly. so for example to use Tom Wolfe's books as an example um, his book A Man in Full is set in Atlanta 
Well, Atlanta has a very specific makeup of people in it, as does New York in his first book. And so you're going to find different people in Atlanta than you would find in New York. And so to even, um, you know, to even capture the city, you need to capture the characters who live there. My book is set in kind of a fictionalized version of Houston, which I lived in Houston for two years. And I, I had come from Chicago, born, raised, went to college in Chicago. And I had no idea what to expect when I arrived in Texas. And um, it, there's a completely different cast of characters in Texas and in the Houston school system than there would have been in Chicago. So I think you, it's, it's impossible to separate the story or the characters from the place. Well, and when you moved to Houston, um, mm -hmm. you probably did not dig into, you know, the history of Sam Houston and, uh, you know, the, the, the war, uh, you know, with Texas and Mexico and the, the battle over mm -hmm. territories, all of that stuff didn't matter. Uh, but as you met people, you started to kind of understand the flavor of the place through these people's experiences and expressions. That is which, correct. And which also, is how we uh -huh. want to experience them in a book. Kind of. Yes. And I, I never I mean, I I know that Houston is named after Sam Houston and I don't know the, the story of how the city came to be. But what was interesting was the teaching program that I was part of when I came to Houston did bring in somebody who talked about kind of the demographic history of Houston. And I thought I mean, I was really happy that I learned that early on. And it did kind of help me understand, you know, who, who the people are in the city, how they got there, um, and how all these people came together and, you know, to interact with each other. So, um, to, you, you talked earlier about your, the things that, um, uh, inspired you to become a teacher and then a writer. Do you see those two paths as kind of intertwined that, that one is really an expression of the other? Hmm. Yes, for sure. Because first of all, I was an English teacher. So I spent so much time trying to communicate what I appreciated about writing to kids. Um, but I also in, in talking to kids about writing, you learn to really inspect writing and notice new things about it. So if you're explaining, I mean, I've read Romeo and Juliet probably more than any human being should. I think I've listened to the audio of it and watch the movie of it maybe 30 times. Um, you start to notice things and you're pointing so many things out to high school students that you start to notice them yourself in everything that you read. So one of the things that I started doing kind of in, in my um, life as a high school teacher, but really, really started doing it as an author is on a site called Goodreads, you can make bookshelves and you can organize your books based on whatever you want to. And I have about 55 bookshelves on Goodreads. And I will, instead of reviewing books, I'll just put them in different categories, like, you know, dialogue done well, uh, workplace scenes that ring true. Um, and, and then that way, when I want to reference for authors that are doing things well, I can just go back and look at those categories and figure out whose book to look at. Gotcha. What, what was the, um, uh, you, you've written a couple of books now. What was the, the first book that you wrote? The first book that I wrote was a book called See Me After Class, which is advice for teachers by teachers. And that's a non nonfiction book. It was originally called Hard Liquor for the Teacher's Soul. <laughs> and I was pitching it with that it. title. Um, I think that title kind of better captures the tone of the book, but nobody wanted a liquor related. Um, nobody wanted to publish a liquor related teacher book. But the basic but it's premise. it's so funny. <laughs> thank you. It, and it is a funny book. And I think one of the things as a new teacher, my when I was a new teacher, I couldn't find anything that was funny or that felt honest that talked about the teaching experience. And I think that's partly just because there are kids involved. And everyone wants to be very, very careful what they say and what they treat as humorous. But what ends up happening is you have these really dark moments in your classroom. And often you feel like 
<clears throat> if you're the only one having these moments, maybe a better, you know, a, a better adult should have stepped in and, and done your job. And that can be very discouraging. And then my sister started teaching about three years after I did, my younger sister. And so I was telling her these stories from my own classroom that I thought were helpful. And they were the stories that you would never share in a meeting or you would never see in a book. And I thought, why does why has nobody collected these stories? And no, why has no one collected this advice? And that was how the book idea came to be. Gotcha. Um, what was the what was the experience writing that first book? Did you, um, uh, you know, when you're writing that first book, no one knows that you're doing it and you're kind of working on it in in secret. Uh, you know, it's not you don't announce these things to the whole world. Uh, when you finished it, what did you do with it? Well, I was lucky that Miami has a really good program called the Miami Writers Institute. It's connected with the Miami Book Fair. And they bring in authors once a year for like a three-day conference. And the year that I started writing this book, I had maybe 10 pages of notes. I had no idea what to do with them. And that conference had a, a workshop called... Um, putting your passion into print or something like that. It was this husband and wife team that uh, the husband is a, a best-selling author and the wife is his agent. And they go around the country explaining to people how the publishing industry works and how to get your book published. So um, I was lucky. I think they call themselves the book doctors, if, if any of your listeners um, want to look them up. But Within three days, I knew the basic path to getting a book published, which did not make it easy. It took another four years to see the book in print, but right. but at least you knew. At what least you were I knew where I was going. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you sold the book. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, the 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 book that's out now, Adequate Yearly Progress, is fiction, and it's a uh, it's it's really a, a biting satire. Um, where did the idea to kind of take some of these things that you explored in the first book, but to, to really build a cast around that and tell a story? Well, a couple of things happened. One thing that happened was because I was promoting this nonfiction book for teachers, I had to get out of my classroom and do things in the education world that I wouldn't have done if I were just a teacher. So I would speak at conferences. I would go to these televised, um, you know, teacher panels that were going to be on TV. And I got to be on TV myself and on the radio myself. And it gave me more of an idea of how the whole education ecosystem works. Um, what I also noticed is I was very often the only teacher on these panels or at these conferences that were entirely about education. And I also noticed that when teachers tried to make themselves heard, let's say on a TV panel, we're really bad at it because we're so used to explaining ourselves over the course of a 45-minute lesson. But to talk on TV, you have to boil down what you want to say to about nine seconds, I think, is the typical sound bite. So teachers were kind of starting this long thing and then just getting cut off. And then people who had an agenda, and everyone had different agendas, so I'm not, I'm not nitpicking anyone's particular motivation, but people who weren't teachers but had something they wanted to say about education and were better at talking about it than teachers were having much more of an impact than teachers were. And I felt like there was nothing in the popular culture that we could point to, to say, no, 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 no. Teaching is not the way that you are picturing it when you're making these recommendations. Teaching is like this. You definitely can't point to a teacher movie because that's an entirely fake Hollywood storyline. Um, based on someone's imagination of what teaching is like. Um, so I wanted to, to you know, I, I kept looking for ways to get those points across. And then the other thing that happened was that uh, I used to do something called National Novel Writing Month with my students, which is the month of, hey, oh yeah, I'm sure you and your listeners have heard of, of NaNoWriMo. 
So I would do the classroom friendly version of, of it, which they, they have this nice website specifically for teachers who want their students to try to write a novel during the month of November. And just as the, um, just as the smoke was kind of clearing from the first book and I found myself with nothing to really write or nothing to really do, um, National Novel Writing Month was right around the corner and I was encouraging maybe a fifth um, year worth of students to participate. And one of them said, how about you? Have you ever done th this challenge? And I said, no, no, you know, it's for, it's for my students. And they said, they, they kind of pointed out to me, how am I going to, um, you know, bribe students with pizza parties and encourage them to take on this huge challenge and not try it myself? And so suddenly I realized, you know what, I'm going to do it. and I'm going to earn my part in the pizza party also. And it was very motivating to be able to share that experience with that group of kids. It really is. It's there's nothing like having to knock out 50,000 words in, in one uh, month to not so much convince you that you can write a novel, but to just make you stop worrying about whether you can write a novel. Yeah, yeah there, there's no time to to you know do any belly button gazing. You've <laughs> no, get down to work every day. No, and I mean when you look back on your worst writing, it, it can be very demotivating. So it it really helps to have to write so fast that you cannot look back at your first draft at all until it's completely finished. Right. Well, you know what else NaNoWriMo uh, teaches you is that it, if you if you win uh, or, or finish, you mm -hmm. know, with, with your 50,000 words, um, then you have 50,000 words that, that may not be good, mm -hmm. but it can be edited. Absolutely. And at least you have a, a platform to, you know, you, you can look back, well, well, this was a good idea, but I didn't really explore that here. Let me just write into it and, and, you know, flesh that out. Or, mm -hmm. you know, this was a really horrible metaphor. But now I can take time and I can think of a better metaphor. And, Absolutely. you know, it, 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 editing something is better than staring at a blank page every day. It is. It is. And a lot of times when you're editing, you realize that you may not be saying what you want to say, but you are you have something in there that's doing the job of what you want to say. Right. So I, I say I always tell people on a first draft, go ahead and put that terrible cliche metaphor in there. <laughs> and then if you really, really hate what you're writing, write in all capital letters. So you'll just know to go right back into that and try to find a better way of saying it. But you want that thought pinned down on the paper so that you can do something with it later. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so tell us about the the story. Like, OK, you decided to do NaNoWriMo with your with your students. Mm -hmm. um, how did you just decide what the story was going to be? I think I always had not, not necessarily the ambition to write a novel, but I always had a sense that I would love to see a novel that is something like what Tom Wolfe would write if he were trying to capture the teaching profession. So I figured, you know, if I'm going to take on this challenge, why not write the novel that I wish existed in the world and that I'm, I feel qualified to write? It was terrible. The first version was terrible. This is about, 30 drafts later as it should be mm -hmm. the first one should yeah. be terrible yeah um the uh well uh my oldest son uh ian is uh a sixth grade english teacher okay. and he's in his second year of teaching right now mm -hmm. and you know we have had many conversations you know over the past couple of years uh you know on weekends and stuff where he's like dad let me tell you what teaching really is about mm -hmm. and you know and it's um it, it's a it's a strange we find ourselves in a strange place when it comes to education these days um because we want students to uh to all be on the same page we want them learning at uh uh at comparable levels we want to make sure people are learning therefore we set standards that need to be uh met and you mm -hmm. know the uh, we think that the only way to know if a kid is, is learning is to, you know, see that they meet certain criteria and standards and all that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as that flows down the river of bureaucracy mm -hmm. and lands on the teacher's desk, it becomes, 
um, you know, a very stifling thing. Um, that obviously uh, is a a sentiment and uh, a thing that you're exploring in this book. Um, what uh, can you kind of tell us about the impetus for, um, you know, where the frustrations are coming from in this book? Well, the teachers. So one of the things about the teachers is that they have professional lives and they each have a different take on their professional life and what teaching should be and what it means to be a good teacher. But they also each have personal lives. And sometimes those impact the professional lives and sometimes the professional lives impact the personal lives. So one of the things I think is missing in most teaching stories is that these teachers are actually human beings that go home from teaching and have other concerns. So um, that, that was something that I tried to capture in there. I'm not sure if this is fully answering your question. I feel like it's, <laughs> I feel like it's well, not. Uh huh. Well, the, the, yeah, that's something that, that none of us ever think about is, mm -hmm. is that teachers are real people and they have families at home and, you know, they have mortgages and they have, you know, dogs that need to go to the vet and kids that get sick and, you know, uh, all, and, you know, relationship problems or successes or, or whatever. And you really put a human face to, um, to a profession that, uh, really gets, um, stereotyped a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, why, why do you think it is that teachers hold this place in our minds where they're, they don't always seem like real people to us? I think that the stories that we see about teachers on the media, in the media, um, have something to do with this because, um, first of all, most teacher characters are, I mean, most teachers do not end up writing in Hollywood and most, um, you know, Hollywood writers haven't been teachers, but at the same time, a lot of people think they know at least something about the profession because everyone has gone to school. So what ends up happening with teachers is I call them single adjective characters. You see teachers in a lot of movies and a lot of TV shows, but they're always the fill in the blank with this adjective teacher. And then, I mean, the, sure, they're funny backdrops to other people's stories. They're certainly, you know, funny teacher characters in a lot of high school based comedies and, and TV shows, but you don't really have the, the kind of fully nuanced flawed characters that are teachers. And when we do see teachers acting in, in funny or, you know, non-perfect ways. A lot of times the the angle that I would say TV and, and movies take is, hey, wouldn't it be funny if this role model acted in a way that was just totally inappropriate? So, I mean, that can be funny and I don't mean to take away from the humor of that. But let's say you have a movie like Bad Teacher um, and then there's so many other versions of this character. It's the teacher who's always hung over. She's always calling the kids stupid. She's always doing things that would get a real teacher fired, and therefore she's not recognizable to real teachers. So, I mean, she, certainly those characters play a role and they can be funny. But when it comes to people really having an understanding of what a human being who does the job of teaching is, I don't think that they do a great job of that. Gotcha. Um, when, you know, this, uh, this book is a really fantastic ensemble cast. Mm -hmm. Um, you, lots of characters in here. Um, and, and you really work to, to show us multiple sides of these characters, not just single adjective characters like you, uh, so deftly said. Um, but when you first started, uh, writing the story, was, was Herman the first character that came to you? Let's see, the first character, actually, the first character that came to me was a very, very minor, ended up being a very, very minor character, which is the teacher who works next door to a character called Katie. And the very first line that I wrote was about her. Um, but pretty early on, I think there was kind of a, a science teacher character that was similar to Hernan. And then there was an English teacher character who was kind of a maybe twice the age of of Lena, of the character that became Lena. And I realized that over time, this character needed to be younger to have the 
the things going on in her personal life that she would need to have that, that she has going on in the book. What's, uh, what's great about this book is that, uh, it, it you really do, um, deal with some, uh, some complex issues, uh, in, in the book and you really make us think, uh, about the, the state of education and what the people that are involved, uh, in, in education are, are thinking and, and, you know, the struggles and trials that they have. But it is so funny. Um, it was from the beginning, did you know that humor was going to play such a strong role in this book? First of all, thank you. Cause that's, a, that's a perfect, that's the exact compliment that I would have wanted when I first sat down to, to write this book. So I appreciate your, your reading of it. Um, I think that, I mean, my, my writing in general has tended to be funny, but at the same, and, and humor is important to me, so I don't want to act like it's just accidental. I, in fact, I kind of, I'm kind of a comedy nerd that will even, you know, listen to podcasts where comedians spend an hour breaking down one joke. But in, in my own writing, I think the main thing that I go for is honesty. Like everything, I want everything to feel completely real the way it would feel to this character. And the the scenes that people tell me that really made them laugh were just the ones where I think I nailed the honesty, you know, how it really feels to be in this situation. So, I mean, and there's, yeah, I, I would, that's probably my best answer. I, I always go for honesty. I think humor and honesty are so closely related. I think people, if people, if people don't think that it's, if it doesn't ring true, it's not going to make people laugh, but it's also not, there's a lot of other things it's not going to do for people if it doesn't ring true also. Well, and, and I think part of that is because reality a lot of times is so completely absurd, um, especially when we're, when we're thinking about teaching and our point of reference is either our memories of sitting in a classroom and, you know, having, have, having formed, you know, adolescent opinions about a teacher and they're usually mm -hmm. very one dimensional, very one adjective, mm -hmm. like you said, or our, the portrayals in movies. And, and you, you know, explain to us, you know, all about that. And, and the, uh, and, and then to see the kind of absurdity of real life and how, uh, it, people are way more complex than we give them credit for and situations are way more complex. And it's just, it's hilarious when you see that actually peeled back. Thinking, thinking about the question you asked about humor and honesty and how they're combined, I think one situation that can really demonstrate that is being at a pep rally and feeling lonely and ver also very not pepped up by the pep rally would be an example of something that if you can tap into it in a way that feels honest you're going to find a lot of individual people who have had an experience like that where everyone in the crowd seems pumped up and you're having the opposite reaction and you're not exactly sure why, but one thing's for sure, there's no one cheering for the feeling that you're having and there's no one verifying that anyone else in the whole crowd feels that way. So I think those are the moments that can just dig in deep and make a connection with one person who knows that feeling. And even if you love pep rallies, uh, which I don't particularly, but clearly lots of people do, you've had that feeling somewhere where everyone seems to be feeling something. You're having the opposite feeling. Can't quite put your finger on why. I try to put my finger on why you might be feeling that way. Well, and that's why dark humor is so important and usually so biting uh, because it, it's, it's the kind of raw reality. Um, but, but then, you know, having the wherewithal to step outside that and realize just kind of how absurd everything is. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. And then another thing that happens when you're writing alone in a room and you're hoping to make that connection, even though, and, and especially in this book, none of the characters are based on me. There's no like secret Roxana Eldon character buried in there, but you're still putting yourself out there as an author saying, I have noticed that this dynamic exists with humans. And probably that's because I've felt this way. 
And so you're always taking the risk of putting it out there and having pretty much the whole world say, nope, never, never experienced that. That's not normal. That's, that's not really a part of the human experience. So, yeah. So. Who, who do you think um, is the ideal audience for this book? Is it teachers? Is it uh, the rest of us who need, um, you know, to, and, an appropriate look at, at the teacher's lives and what they go through. Um, who do you feel like is the ideal reader for this book? <laughs> well, the ideal reader for this book is someone who has a teacher at the table when they celebrate Thanksgiving. And the teacher keeps saying, no, 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 no. It's, it's not like that. And stop telling me to uh, make my lessons fun or, you know, make it relevant to the kids' lives as if that is real teaching advice. And that teacher keeps getting frustrated. I want them to be able to give this book to that other person and have the other person read it. And I hope that that person enjoys the storyline, you know, completely independent of the fact that it's about teachers. Um, but I also hope that the teacher who gave it to them feels that it it rang true enough that that's why they're handing it over. So in a way there's two audiences and then plus just anyone who enjoys workplace comedy. So if you watch parks and recreation, if you watch the office, <laughs> if you watch Silicon Valley and you read novels and you care at all about something set in a school, I think you would be the perfect audience for it. I think so too. It, it is so much fun. I love this book so much. I, I loved it so much at the end. I wished I could, have never have read it and read it oh, again for the first you. time. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love it. You're welcome. Um, the book has it came out yesterday. When people are hearing this, it's available in paperback and audiobook and Kindle uh, edition. However you read books, it's available. Um, we're going to put links to it in the show notes. Roxana, if people are just learning about you, want to dig into all the great stuff that you do and connect with you, is there a place they can do that online? Yes, you can find me at RoxanaEldon.com. And everything I do is is pretty much summarized. I'll also share something interesting about the audio version of the book because I'm very, very excited about the audio version. Please do. So I'm a big audio reader. I have been since my kids were born. And I realized that my mind was never occupied having babies, but my hands were always occupied. And there was just no chance of me reading a book. And I got very into audio books. And there are a few audio narrators who I think are so wonderful, that I would often start my day of writing by kind of just replaying like a uh, like a playlist, a few of the chapters they've narrated in my favorite books. And one of those narrators who really stood out was a narrator named Roxana Ortega, who narrated, fantastic. you know who she is? Oh, yes. Great. Okay. Yes. Uh, she narrated A Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer Egan, which She's narrated quite a few other books, but that particular book has so many different perspectives. It has men and women. It has people of different ages and backgrounds. And I thought that Roxana Ortega managed to just capture the energy and the tone of every single one of those characters. And I listened to her book so much um, while I was writing my book, and I would just zoom back and forth between different chapters based on the, the mood that I wanted to be in when I was writing. So I specifically requested her as the narrator for my book. And I wrote my editor this long email. And I'm so thrilled to say that she is the narrator of the book. And so I haven't heard it yet, but I cannot wait to listen to her version of the book. And I think that it's going to be a real treat to listen to the audio of this book. Oh, I love that story so much. I just added it to my Audible queue. Oh, good. Uh, so I can't wait. To, I can't wait to hear that. And what a great um, idea, you know, when you're writing, uh, because I'm a huge audiobook fan, too. And, uh, you know, uh, doing this show, audiobooks are the only way that I can keep up and, and you know, uh, go through people's back catalogs and, and you know, do reading of my own for, for enjoyment is, is, you know, lots and lots of audiobooks, And uh, I have narrators that I love and I have certain parts of a book that they've done that I love. Mm -hmm. And what a great idea to find those and re-listen to those to capture that tone that you're trying 
to achieve in your own writing. What a great piece of advice. Thank you. And in fact, I do tell writers to do this because especially because the advice that we're so often given as writers is read your own work out loud. But the thing yeah. is, I don't like how I sound out loud. So it really helps. To, I mean, you know, I sound fine, but I wouldn't. I mean, listening to yourself talk too long out loud. It's like listening to that answering machine message you hate for like <laughs> yes. 40 minutes. <laughs> So right. the thing is that these people are professionals and to have their voice in your head instead of your own voice in your head actually makes you be able to hear your writing more so than just be annoyed by the sound of your own voice. What a great piece of advice. Um, the new book, Adequate Yearly Progress, is out available everywhere now. Um, be sure to grab the audio. It's going to be fantastic, I know. Um, Roxana, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank with me you. Today. I love talking to you about this. This is very fun. Stay tuned now for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. The near future. Humanity's only hope of survival entered the solar system at nearly the speed of light. The probe slowed as the sun's heliosphere disrupted the graviton wave it rode in on from the abyss of deep space. Awakened by the sudden deceleration, the probe absorbed the electromagnetic spectrum utilized by its target species and assessed the technological sophistication of the sole sentient species on Earth. The probe adjusted its course to take it into the system's primary. If the humans couldn't survive, with its help, what was to come, then the probe would annihilate itself. There would be no trace of it for the enemy, and no chance of humanity's existence beyond the time it had until the enemy arrived. The probe analyzed filed patents, military expenditures, birth rates, mathematical advancement, and space exploration. The first assessment fell within the margin of error of survival and extinction for humanity. The probe's programming allowed for limited, autonomous decision-making, choice being a rare luxury for the probe's class of artificial intelligence. The probe found itself in a position to choose between ending its mission in the sun's fire and a mathematically improbable defense of humanity, and the potential compromise of its much larger mission. Given the rare opportunity to make its own decision, the probe opted to dither. In the week it took to pass into Jupiter's orbit, the probe took in more data. It scoured the Internet for factors to add to the assessment, but the assessment remained the same. Unlikely, but possible. By the time it shot past Mars, the probe still hadn't made a decision. As the time to adjust course for Earth or continue into the sun approached, the probe conducted a final scan of cloud storage servers for any new information and found something interesting. While the new information made only a negligible impact on the assessment, the probe adjusted course to Earth. It hadn't traveled all this way for nothing. In the desert south of Phoenix, Arizona, it landed with no more fanfare than a slight thump and a few startled cows. Then it broke into the local cell network and made a call. Mark Ibarra awoke to his phone ringing at max volume, playing a pop ditty that he hated with vehemence. He rolled off the mattress that lay on the floor and crawled on his hands and knees to where his cell was recharging. His roommate, who paid the majority of their rent and got to sleep on an actual bed, grumbled and let off a slew of slurred insults. Mark reached his cell and slapped at it until the offending music ended. He blinked sleep from his eyes and tried to focus on the caller's name on the screen. The only people who'd call at this ungodly hour were his family in Bosque country, or maybe Jessica in his applied robotics course wanted a late-night study break. The name on the screen was Answer Me. He closed an eye and reread the name. It was way too early, 
or too late, depending on one's point of view, for this nonsense. He turned the ringer off and went back to bed. Sleep was about to claim him when the phone rang again, just as loudly as last time, but now with a disco anthem. Seriously? His roommate slurred. Mark declined the call and powered the phone off. He flopped back on his bed and curled into his blanket. To hell with my first class, he thought. Arizona State University had a lax attendance policy, one which he'd abused for nights like this. The cell erupted with big band music. Mark took his head out from beneath the covers and looked at his phone like it was a thing possessed. The phone vibrated so hard that it practically danced a jig on the floor, and the screen flashed Answer Me over and over again as music blared. Dude, said his roommate, now sitting up in his bed. Mark swiped the phone off the charging cord, and the music stopped. The caller's name undulated with a rainbow of colors, and an arrow appeared on the screen, pointing to the button he had to press to answer the call. When did I get this app? He thought. Mark sighed and left the bedroom, meandering into the hallway bathroom with the grace of a zombie. The battered mattress he slept on played hell with his back and left him stiff every morning. Dropping his boxers, he took a seat on the toilet and answered the call, determined to return this caller's civility with some interesting background noise. What? he murmured. Mark Ibarra, I need to see you. The voice was mechanical, asexual in its monotone. Do you have any friggin' idea what time it is? Wait, who the hell is this? You must come to me immediately. We must discuss the mathematical proof you have stored in document title This Can't Be Right dot doc. Mark shot to his feet. The boxers around his ankles tripped him up, and he stumbled out of the bathroom and fell against the wall. His elbow punched a hole in the drywall, and the cell clattered to the floor. He scooped the phone back up and struggled to breathe as a sudden asthma attack came over him. <laughs> how? How? He couldn't finish his question until he found his inhaler in the kitchen mere steps away in the tiny apartment. He took a deep breath from the inhaler and felt the tightness leave his lungs. That someone knew of his proof was impossible. He'd finished it earlier that night, and had encrypted it several times before loading it into a cloud file that shouldn't have been linked to him in any way. How do you know about that? he asked. You must come to me immediately. There is little time. Look at your screen the robotic voice said. His screen changed to a map program, displaying a pin in an open field just off the highway, connecting Phoenix to the suburb of Maricopa. Come. Now. Mark grabbed his keys. An hour later, his jeans ripped from scaling a barbed wire fence, Mark was surrounded by desert scrub. The blue of the morning rose behind him, where his beat-up Honda waited on the side of the highway. With his cell to his ear, Mark stopped and looked around before deciding how to continue. Spiked ocotillo plants looked a lot like benign mesquite trees in the darkness. A Native American casino in the distance served as his north star, helping him keep his bearings. You're not out here, are you? I'm being punked, aren't I? He asked the mysterious caller. You are 9.26 meters to my east-southeast. Punk. Decayed wood. Used as tinder. Are you on fire? The caller said. Mark rolled his eyes. This wasn't the first time the caller had used the non-standard meanings of words during what passed as conversation between the two. Mark had tried to get the caller to explain how he knew about his theorem and why they had to meet in the middle of the desert. The caller had refused to say anything. He would only reiterate that Mark had to come quickly to see him, 
chiding him every time Mark deviated from the provided driving directions. If you're so close, why can't I see you? He asked. He took a few steps in what he thought was a northwesterly direction and squished into a cow patty.